Do you have any other old records besides these? Seymour does. Who does? Oh, uh, him. Seymour. He's, uh, he's the man with the records. Do you have any old Indian records? Indian records? Uh, yeah, you know, like old Indian 1960s rock and roll music. I may have one Hindu 78 in my collection from the 20s, but it's uh, it's not really for sale. I, I, I don't really collect foreign. Those are all 78s? You, you play 78s? Oh, maybe not 78s, but... I can play regular records. Well, there's, there's, some, uh, there's some good stuff in here. You, you like old music? Uh, yeah, it's good. Well, there's some choice LPs in here that uh, reissue some really great old blues stuff. Hmm. How about this one? Is it any good? Nah, that one's not so great. Excuse me. This is the one I'd recommend. It's, uh, and this track alone by Memphis Mini is worth about $500 if you own the original 78. I know the guy who owns the original and lent it for use on this reissue. Wow. How much is it? Dollar seventy-five. If you don't like it, you can uh, you can bring it back for a refund. We're here every Saturday. I'm sure it's okay. Hello, and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi, everyone. It's October 1st. We made it. We actually made it. <laughs> we made it through Mercury and retrograde, y'all. <laughs> Oh, uh, it was horrible. That was a horrible Mercury retrograde. And then you, we were just saying before we got on the air, like New York was was like underwater this week. It's been just, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad it's October first. I got up this morning and I was I was making my cot. There's like a slight chill in the air here in San Diego. It's a little drizzly. It's like a weight has been lifted. <laughs> I just love October so much. And I cannot wait to talk about today's book and movie. But before we get to that, you know, perhaps you found us today because you're into graphic novels. And uh, sometimes we've done a couple of graphic novels in our history. But really what we talk about here is movies that have been adapted mostly from books. But really, if we're being honest, they're adapted from any kind of literary source, because we try to crank out a brand new episode every single week. And, you know, we're busy people. We were just we were just going over our itinerary. Our, we have a very busy week coming up. So we're not going to be, you know, it's not going to be uh, Phantom of the Opera at this time. It's going to it's going to be something a little shorter. Sometimes we have time to do, you know, something longer. But in October, we do like to plan spooky type movie adaptations. I am very we're kind of baby stepping into the spooky waters today with today's episode. <laughs> All of this is to say that we have a really wonderful community of listeners who give us the most amazing suggestions, including what we're going to be talking about today. This was a listener suggestion. If you have ideas for books and movies or, you know, a, a magazine article, a song, a play, anything that's been adapted into a film that is easy to stream, um, it, as long as we can get our hands on both the source material and the movie in an easy kind of way that everybody can get, then we will consider it. So there's a few places where you can meet other listeners, interact with us, make your suggestions, and uh, basically enjoy us on the internet. We are on Facebook. We have a basic Facebook page, but that's just a place to post the episodes. We don't really interact there. We're much more interactive in our Facebook group. Please join the Facebook group if you do have Facebook on your phone. If you do check Facebook, it's Book VS Movie Podcast, and you have to ask to join. Thaddeus was kind enough to put up two lists at the very top. One of them is a list of shows we've done already, pretty complete. And the other list is the shows that uh, people have in mind for us in the future. That's the Book VS Movie Podcast group. On threads and Twitter and Instagram, you spell out book, verses, and movie. Please follow us in all those places if you use those uh, social media sites. And we also have an old-timey email, 
book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. And if you would like some stick, we'll send you some stickers. Send us your address. Also, uh, as Margot said, the movie needs to be streaming. We were going to co- talk about something else with another person, a special guest. And at the last minute, they took it away from us from streaming. So you do do double check that for us and make sure. But anyway, yes, Margot, those are all the places. If you really, really enjoy the show and you would like to kind of, you know, look, we've, we're coming up if, again, for those of you who are new, we've been around for a really long time and in podcast terms, we're coming up on 10 years, which is Ancient. unbelievable. A very long time. Uh, if you would like to be a part of keeping this show going, you can also support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We have been doing the show for nine years now. What we've decided to do is we put two years worth of shows in the regular feed, that's for freezies and also all the holiday Christmas stuff because you all seem to love that every year. But everything else we put on the Patreon wall, what we've done recently put to put up there, Silence of the Lamb, Psycho, Turn of the Screw, Stepford Wives, Phantom of the Opera, and Stand By Me. They're all there on our Patreon wall, plus dozens of other episodes. And we use that money seriously just to get us our books and movies and you know, ship them to each other. So thank you all so much who support us there. But we ask that, look, if money's tight, we totally understand. If you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend about the show or ask for a sticker and put it on your laptop and go to the coffee shop and look cool. That'd be amazing. I remember hearing about today's mm-hmm. movie. I think I was already married when it came. Yeah, I definitely was already married when it came out. I never saw it. And I I remember just people liking it and talking about it. But I I got to tell you, Margot, I had never seen this movie. I didn't know anything about it but the title. I did not know it was a grab based on a graphic novel. I knew absolutely zero, nothing about it, which is unusual for us. Usually going into an episode, I know something about it, even if I haven't read the book or whatever. Um, this is a rare occasion where I'm just totally blind. So I decided to go in completely cold, got my hands on the, gra- again, I didn't even know it was a graphic novel. Like I had to go find that out on my own and and got my hands on the graphic novel, read it. I didn't read anything about the author, anything about the movie. I wanted to know nothing about it. So I really wanted to have like a fresh experience. What would it be like being a young person um, reading these, uh, the series of, you know, um, comics in the 90s? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) We are talking about Ghost World. At first, I was, I got to say, I was a little trepidatious. I was like, really? Like, that's a dude he's writing about. Like, I know what it's like to be a, an adolescent young person in the 90s. Like, I'll be the judge of that. I got to say, mm-hmm. I'm very impressed. I am very impressed. Um, let's get into it. Let's let's start with our, our author, because he's no slouch. No, it's Daniel Klaus born uh, 1961 in Chicago. He's known for Eight Ball is the series that he's seriously known for. And then Ghost World is a part of that within there. We should make this clear. We're not experts when we take on a book in a movie. We always kind of just dive in and just do the best we can with it. He, uh, like I said, he was very popular. The, these were very popular stories. So Terry Zweigoff is our director and he basically contacted him and said, I'd like to do my first feature because he did Crumb before that. And Crumb was the illustrator that's from San Francisco. Yes. And that was how I had heard of the movie because Mm -hmm. I had seen Crumb. I saw Crumb in the art house. I must have been in college. I saw Crumb in the art house. And I remember everybody being like, oh, God, you remember the guy that made Crumb? He's made this. And if you've not seen Crumb, the documentary, I mean, it's it's also extremely impressive. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, he does, I think, the, a really great job of giving you a very full picture of, um, of this very <laughs> uh, controversial artist. Um, so anyway, so you were saying he wanted to make a feature, a feature film, you know, a fiction film, right? Uh, and wanted to do it based on Ghost Ghost World. Yes. So Close had won. Uh, Klaus, excuse me, had won the Harvey Awards, Eisner Awards. I mean, he, he's known as a graphic novelist, and people. San Diego Comic Con, like everywhere, everyone knows who this man is. So Terry's wig off wanted to make his first feature and have it based on, you know, original material, something different. And people told him you should look up this material. And it's so for me, 
I never read this before. So we have a book called Adaptations, and it's from short story to big screen. It's a whole bunch of short stories, and Margo and I have just been mainlining on this when we have a hard time figuring out what to do for the show. And they have a story in there called Hubba Hubba. So this is 1997, and it has Enid and Becky. She's known in the book, but she's Rebecca. It's their story, and then what he did was he combined with Zwigoff, and they created this film. So the 1997, and this is the most 1997 ish thing I've ever seen are these girls in this story and they're new teenage I mean they're they're newly graduated from high school so they're like 18 but they're they're kids to me 18 year olds are kids. yeah well um in the film Scarlett Johansson is 16 when she made she was 15 movie. when she auditioned um, yes yeah. <laughs> I mean um in the in the I read the graphic version I yeah I was super impressed like I really felt transported back to the 90s now my and it was very it was extremely reflective of my adolescent experience like if you go back I'm gonna say you know maybe 10 years I'm 10 mm -hmm. years older than these girls are um so if you're going back to like the the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s that's when I was going same to experience. but I mean I had at least one friend like this I several right, right. and you go through this cycle I mean I was so impressed at the way that he captured adolescent girl friendship. We even had a we even had a guy friend that was like Josh that we you know annoyed all the time just for funsies. Very very impressed. And uh, so yeah, we have these two girls, and they have been friends. We established early on that they have been friends since they were tiny. They've known each other, and and they know each other super super well. And are very close. They know everything about each other. In the graphic novel, anyway, I don't think they've quite graduated yet. Mm -hmm. It's it's looming. and But they have this plan. They are planning that, you know, when they graduate, they're going to, like, become, you know, working young women and get an apartment and live their independent lives finally the way that they always dreamed of doing. Which is what you think of uh, when you're 18. You don't think about sure. beyond like a couple of years. You're just like, I yeah. just need to get a job in an apartment. Like those are just exactly. simple things. Yeah. And their plan is really that they're not going to go to college. They have decided that they're not going to go to college. That why should they wait to live the lives they want? They don't need college for that. This is sort of the idea. And they, you know, they do what teenagers do. They play pranks on people. You know, there's a lot of like prank calling and stuff going on. And they have this guy friend um named josh and it's always unclear like whether one or the other of them has a crush on josh or whether he has feelings for them we don't really know because they're you know these are very young people with not a lot of um emotional experience and so they're so they're figuring these things out right and they're also growing independent of their parents we see a little bit of their relation they seem to have good relationships with their parents i would say on the whole oh, yeah um they don't have like abusive parents or anything like that. They just, it's very, it's honestly, it's like not a lot going on. It's just these two teenagers who are friends um, near the end of high school and they're trying to just figure out they're about to launch into the next phase of their lives, um, which doesn't feel like a big event. It's just sort of a thing. It's just life keeps going on. And uh, eventually through the course of the, of the graphic novel and, the, and it's different than in the movie. And, and, and we'll talk about the movie when we get to it, but but eventually they, you know, once they're really faced with time moving on, I think they really, they start to sort of realize that they kind of have outgrown the friendship, or at least the friendship is going through a phase where, you know, they maybe are going to be apart for a little bit. They still, it doesn't mean they don't care about each other. They don't have that history, but um, I mean, but this is, I, it, it was happens. so authentic. I was so impressed. Yeah. I don't know. I'm really impressed with this book. I was I'm super impressed with it. I mean, it does bring back a lot of memories. And the same thing for you. I'm like 10 years older than these girls. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same mm -hmm. thing. And especially for 90, the mid 90s, the ironic detachment and sort of mm -hmm. everything sucks. Nothing's original. Nothing's really cool. People like the dumbest, lamest things. Mm -hmm. That's what you Very would Daria. say. Right. I mean, they're just uh -huh. very Daria. I mean, they're just it's like, you know, Nirvana 
times a thousand. Like it's just they're like I said, the ironic detachment. So they go to like the they go to a fifties diner, but they make fun of the music and they make fun of the server named Al. and we all did this when we were teenagers. You think you're so important and special and you're funny. You really think you're funny, like when you're that age. And sometimes like, nah, you're just Oh mean. yeah. You're oh, we thought I we, we thought we were so hilarious and clever and you know, uh, issuing a steady stream of blazing satire on the the, the situation that we lived in, and uh, yeah, and and these girls. I mean, I I just felt so transported back to that time. I just I, I don't know how we did it. I really don't. He must have teenagers or something. That's got to be something. But I remember when I was that age, I used to think, I thought of this the other day, like I thought adults were so corny, like they laughed and cried over the lamest things, like the the most, you know, the very sentimental. And then as I'm getting older, I'm extremely sentimental. I cry because it's life is powerful sometimes. But at their age, they're kind of like school's boring. I don't want to be here. But so we have to get an apartment. I guess we'll have to get a job. I guess. And who's going to take us around? I guess Josh. So we'll flirt with Josh and give him a hard time. And Josh works at the convenience store. And there's people that come in out of the convenience store. And they meet in the story Hubba Hubba, which is the diner that they go to. They don't have it in the movie, but they see, they notice Seymour. And then Seymour is... Um, Seymour's a character that he's advertising for a date. Like, people used to put ads out for... This is how you met There people. used to be... Yeah, I mean, now people do this on social media. And that's another really key thing is that this is be- this is a pre-social media analyst, which is probably why you and I are, are relate to it so much. Mm-hmm. Is It's still in a world where social media really hasn't happened yet. I looked for my first job in the newspaper, didn't my you? My first apartment and job. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, you go through the Village newspaper. Voice. You get the new- you get it right when it came out in the middle of the night and then you'd sit down with your little red pencil and you'd circle the jobs or the apartments that you were interested in. So these girls are doing that and they come up, there's a section in, in the classifieds uh, where people also list jobs and apartments. There was a, a, maybe it still exists. There was a section called something like missed encounters or something like that. Right. Right. There would be the section where you could leave messages anonymous messages dear sir who saved my puppy from that oncoming car i never got a chance to thank you but you it meant the world to me or or it would be something like dear girl on the train who was reading uh bridget jones diary you had a blue bag um i think you're really cute i am a 17 year old student at nyu you know and and people would would reach out to it sounds so archaic but people really did reach out for connection in this way right and if you're a teenager we and we did this you would read those that section for funsies and giggles and laugh and, at people and laugh at people <laughs> and laugh at people did. being their most vulnerable and right like reaching out because we so don't sad, understand those emotions it's very embarrassing now but we know you because you're not emotionally immature enough to realize like how vulnerable these people are being in the newspaper that everybody reads i and now when i look back on it i just it blows my mind i cannot imagine getting up the guts right to and you would have to call the newspaper on the phone and dictate your message to a human being on the other end of the line i mean it was a whole thing single white female looking to meet the man at the coffee shop who wore the green sweater and yeah. he would read that and he would come or he would not come. So these teens are basically doing this to Seymour. They're, they see him and they see this schlubby guy. That's ha- And that's their interpretation of him. He's middle-aged and he's not exactly like a... They're used to boys. And here's a middle-aged man. And so they, they set this up for him so that he comes to the coffee shop and then he leaves. Basically, in the story, that's pretty much it. Like I said, they're laughing at him and they don't really have feelings for him. But it's like it's a graphic novel. It's really quick. And it also is you're mean sometimes at that age and you don't really appreciate loneliness or, you know, you, you, cause you're and you people don't all the time. You go to school, you go to work, you know, you don't. Yeah, you 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 are playing around again. It's about your emotional development, I guess, and you play around at these things for fun without realizing that there are like actual humans involved in these pranks and that you may be causing them um, harm 
or pain at the very least. So the, the, the whole series has moments like this, you know, like there's a, there's this, and I don't think he's in the movie at all, but there's this much older gentleman who comes into the coffee shop where they normally hang out. Um, and, you know, and we would go and hang out at the coffee shop, you know, after school and whatnot. And get, get French school fries to go to the coffee shop. Yeah. And the bottomless and then, cup of coffee and order nothing yeah. else. The waitresses hated you. <laughs> And there's well. a guy, there's a similar guy who, who also, but he's older and he also hangs out at the coffee shop all day long. And, and, um, and they're always like wondering about him. And, um, it turns out he's a psychic and he offers them a free reading. And, and so they, like, there's this whole thing about them trying to just get up the guts to call him for their free reading. And there's a couple that comes in, they assume that they're, they make up this whole story that this couple, they are Satanists <laughs> and decide to follow them. And, I mean, they kind of have nothing going on in their lives. And so their imaginations go a little wild. It's such a, I mean, I guess adolescent boys must go through the same thing as well. But, but th- I mean, this, that was what we did. And <laughs> That's yeah, just what we did. And if you have like a really pretty friend, she usually gets most of the attention from guys and they pay attention to her first. And it's, it's all this stuff tracks, all this stuff rings true. And also the fact that they're, maturing at different levels at different paces and so Enid kind of wants to be wearing by the way the black hair and the thick glasses and the schlumpy clothes and the boots and stuff and and Becky Rebecca she's a little bit more ready to kind of grow out of that like all right I'm not a high schooler anymore what else is there and that's sort of the tension that's kind of between them because Enid likes having her wingman, like somebody that just, because she's the one that, you know, a, a, a very uh, unfortunate description, but like she's one of those people that does take up oxygen. Like she just is one of those people that takes over their personality, whatever they're curious about, everybody has to then be curious about. I realize Becky's like, eh, I have my own stuff I really want to pursue. And I don't probably want to catfish people like forever because it's mean and I want to do something else. And ultimately, but it, they're all these, it's all these like just series of little vignettes of, of describe, uh, illustrating what Marco just described. And so, you know, the end is at the end, decide it's Enid, right? That decides that she's going to go to college. No, I think Rebecca, am I right? I'm sorry. Is it Rebecca? I'm got him confused now. One of the girls decides that she's going to go to college and that is like breaking a massive, you know, burning a massive bridge. Like, oh, so everything we've always talked about is not actually going to happen. And the girls, their friendship, you know, they have a fight. And and you see both of the, each of the girls in pain, like each of the girls with their crying in their homes and their parents are kind of like, oh gosh, are you okay? And they're like, yeah, I'm fine. Nothing's going on. But they're going through, you know, this pain of that relationship, um, maybe not ending, ending, but certainly evolving and maturing out of what it always has been. Mm-hmm. And um which is such an adolescent, you know, it's such a part of your development growing up. I, I just, and then I think, I can't think ultimately she doesn't go. She's not able to get in or something like that. But anyway, these girls are going from childhood into early adulthood. The friendship is ceasing to serve them and is not going to is not going to survive for a little bit here. We're, we're, we're going into a phase where they're not going to be friends for a while, but they still care about each other. You know, they, it, it's just, it's yeah. so good. It's so good. And the art is fantastic. Um, yeah. It reminded me very much of, uh, of a lot of the comics of the day of like Linda Berry and um, what was that one? This modern world. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it, it was a very like, yeah. Um yeah, I, I mean, like I said, I transported. I loved it. I I don't know what else to say. I, I felt like that was such my, I felt like my adolescence was in this book. Same, same. So this is when we get to this material where we have, uh, once again, uh, Terry Zwigoff is the person that takes on this. And they, they have to, they combine together. So Klaus helps him write the screenplay. They do this together. And it's his first screenplay, and he's nominated for an Academy Award for it. And they g- pitch people, and people are like, well, how hot are the girls? You know, can you make this movie move faster? Because there's a lot of pausing. Because there's not, I mean, it's it's this tale of like a couple of weeks between these girls. It's not, you know, there's not so much that goes on, but some, but... You, you and I know everything is going on between them 
you know, at this time. So why don't we play the trailer and then we'll get into it. <laughs> what do you think you're doing? Shut up that damn noise. Rock and roll, baby. Freedom of speech. <laughs> that guy rules. They can't believe we made it. We graduated high school. How totally amazing. I can't help but feel I had some small part in how you turned out. <sighs> Sometimes I think I might be going crazy from sexual frustration. You just hate every single guy on the face of the earth. That's not true. I just hate all these extroverted, pseudo-bohemian losers. You guys up for some reggae tonight? Do you have any other old records besides these? Seymour does. Who does? Oh, uh, him. He's the man with the records. What, are we in slow motion here? Come on, what are you, hypnotized? Have some more kids, why don't you? Jan pehchan ho. Gina asan ho. I'm allowed to place one student from your graduating class for a full one-year scholarship, and I took the liberty of submitting your name. This could be a really great thing for you. Would I have to take classes and stuff? <laughs> well... I'm just not the kind of guy who has a type. Every guy has a type. What about her? Whoa. Would you go out with her? As long as she's breathing. Hey! Hey! You! How many times I tell you? No check, no service. Get the hell out of my store. What do you think this is? Club Med? It's America, dude. Learn the rules. Loosen up. Yeah. Feel the music. Ghost World, the underground comic book comes to life. We have to get together this summer. Yeah, that'll definitely happen. Written by Daniel Klaus and Terry Zweigoff. Directed by Terry Zweigoff. Do you serve beer or any alcohol? After about five minutes of this movie, you're gonna wish you had 10 beers. So our Enid and Rebecca are Thor Birch and Scarlett Johansson, who are Scarlett Johansson was like, she like born 35 or something. She's so mature and poised. I mean, yeah. she's a kid. I yeah. get that. But they I think they both are oh in this God. film. I, I mean, it's really impressive. I don't know how old Thor Birch is. She um, was when born they... in 82. So she's like okay. 18, 19. Okay. First of all, 100% by this friendship, 100% by mm. their history. Um, Thora Birch was in Hocus Pocus, speaking of spooky movies. Yes. Uh, I always think of her as her the daughter in American Beauty. Like that to me is like the quintessential. Yes. And Thora now Birch and then role. was a movie that yeah. she did about the girls. And she's done like, a lot of stuff. Right. She's um, a million things. Yeah. I saw her on, a, they had a Pittsburgh con and they did an interview with her. And it was like two people asked about Ghost World and everybody else about asked about Hocus Pocus. And I've been mm -hmm. honest, I've never seen Hocus Pocus. I'm sure it's great, but <laughs> it's you know what? Generation. I, listen, I people are gonna freak, but I I only I think I saw it right when it came out. I remember very little about it. Uh haven't seen it since. I know it's on TV all the time, don't have a TV, so I don't it, you know, it's not like it's on in my house all the time. My kids were not into that movie, so didn't see it with them either. Uh, what I mostly remember is that it had Kathy and Jimmy in it, who I absolutely adore. Yeah, and Sarah Jessica <laughs> Parker and Bette Midler. I remember Kathy amazing. and Jimmy, and that's that's what I remember about that movie. Right. Um, and I do remember, I do remember the kids. I do remember that that they were very good. This is a great cast. Yes, it's, it's, this is a really great cast. Ileana Douglas is the art teacher. Oh, uh, she is every art teacher I had. She's every art teacher. She's all the art teach. She's amazing. She, I, I mean, every time hair. she comes on the screen, I am. La I laughed out loud at this movie so many times. I think I laughed out loud at the book a couple of times. This movie made me, I couldn't believe how many times I laughed out loud. When it started, I got to say, like the opening scene, because I had just read the book, the opening scene, and I was like, oh, I don't know. I might hate this movie. I'm going to be really disappointed if it doesn't really deliver on what I just read because I would really like that so much. But when Ileana Douglas shows up, oh man, I'm all in. I'm all in. 
I, and I liked the choice. Okay, let's well, well, let's finish the cast. So we've got Ileana Douglas. Did we talk about Brad Renfro? As Josh. R.I.P. Josh, oh, she's great. He's so good. He was such a good actor. And we also have Bob Balaban as and some really great people. Uh, Stacey Travis is the is Dana, the real estate agent that Steve Buscemi dates. Steve Buscemi. <laughs> my God. Steve Buscemi is so good in this. He's always he is always fantastic. Perfect ah. as Seymour. Perfect. Yeah. Dave Sheridan is Doug and he's the shirtless guy in the mullet with the nunchucks. <laughs> it cracks me up. This Ter- movie is so Terry good. Gar is in this movie. She's great. Everybody is great at this David movie. Cross. Who's the, the one that plays her dad, the one that plays Thora Birch's dad. He's Bob in Balaban. everything. He's in yeah. everything. Everything, everything. He's great. Yeah. He's the perfect dad for her. Uh, Bruce Glover, who's Crispin Glover's father, he mm-hmm. plays the guy in the wheelchair. And it's hilarious. I said, I was listening, I told Margo, I was watching on Criterion Channel, which by the way, it's not on there anymore. Last day was the last day oh. for Ghost World. And they sometimes they have on Criterion the director's commentary and the writer's commentary. So I was listening to them and they said that scene where they're in the coffee shop and he's typing into the computer. And they said it was the last time you could do that where people knew you were not typing into a search engine. Like you just typed a word into a thing. Anyway, they start out with the girls. And like you said, it was almost like Heather's again with the 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 person in the wheelchair giving a speech and we're haha and they're doing hip hop and i had the same reaction I'm like oh god are they just going to be obnoxious and then it just no i mean they do they you do get to know them as people and that whole thing is just their front that they're bored yeah everything's you know just not interesting to them they're actually scared they actually are they're scared of adulthood like they know they're that they need to grow up and they need to go out there but at the on the at the same time it's so comfortable to be home you have your room there you don't have to worry about rent you don't have to worry about things but then you have rules so if you go out, then you have to get a job. And you have to get a job, then you have to follow the rules of the job. You have a boss. They're scared to move forward, but Rebecca's the one that's like, yeah, we need to do this. You know, we, we need to dress. I love it when uh, Scarlett Johansson, so she says, like, we have to dress nice clothes so we can get a nice apartment. We have to look like yuppies. We have to look Which like- is true. Yes. <laughs> Which is very true. If you're if you're an 18 year old recent high school graduate trying to get an apartment, you better show up looking like, dressed for the job you want. Yeah. And and Thora Birch, of course, dyes her hair green and then wears a punk rock. And I love it when she goes to the store and they make fun of her. Punk rock is dead. She's so <laughs> dying for like to be unique and different yeah. and, and special. And it just kills her when she doesn't make that. They meet Seymour in the cafe. And there's Weird Al in the cafe, too. I mean, just like in Hubba Hubba. Pull the prank on him. And then they follow him. And it turns out he sells records in his spare time. Like, he's in a little garage sale. And mm-hmm. that's where we we meet him. And like I said, Buscemi is so good in this movie. Like, your heart breaks for him. <sighs> he has... Oh my gosh yeah i mean we all met we all knew this guy we all knew this guy this guy still lives in my neighborhood i'm sure he's uh and he says as much you know he he is socially awkward doesn't even cover it you inept. know uh, he inept yes and he he has these interests in these obscure vintage things as do i and um and he so he's friends with other weird collectors but he doesn't have you know, he's, he doesn't, he's had not a steady relationship with a woman. He's, he's heterosexual, but he hasn't, he hasn't, you know, been able to maintain that because he's just too weird. He has a job, this corporate job that, um, you know, he just, he, he's, he's been stuck there for years and years and years. Um, and he really only uses it to fund his, his interests, you know, to pay his rent and fund his interests. And he and his roommate, who is a similar, you know, collector weirdo um they have like a a little makeshift flea market in their garage every weekend and and um and the girls after pulling the prank on him of of answering the setting him up with the personal ad thing they discovered they like stumble upon like oh my gosh that's the guy that's the guy that we like (laughs) really hurt he's he's got this like weird little thing with his friend like selling vintage stuff in their garage and And the mongoose like the stuffed mongoose that's a stuffed mongoose (laughs) They, and also, like, and I've been through this before where you go to a table, like, oh, how much is that? Like, I'm not selling that. 
I've, yeah, I've, I've been. Yeah. To, I've been to places or stoop sales Same. where people just instantly go, "Oh no, no, no! I don't want to sell that." But they, they, yep. that's where they meet him. It's like I said, his name makes them laugh. Like everything about him makes him laugh. And at that age, you can't contain yourself when you're laughing. Like teenagers mm-hmm. laugh at everything. As an mm-hmm. adult, you're like, you can't do that. That's mean. It's you know, you have to be. It's mean. It's so mean. <laughs> They're so mean, and I get. And there's some reviewers that were like oh i can't stand these characters because there's and it's like it's just you know why because they're too it's too close to home it is because that's what that's what teenagers are like they're genuine i was like that yes my friend and i would we would we would have gone we would have laughed right in seymour's face and bought the record and bought the record and then asked for something stupid and then laugh about it i think we're being hilarious and they also have josh that they make drive them around and he's he's a cutie pie and and He's so good in in the part. Uh, but Rebecca is the one that gets most of the boys to pay attention to her. And she's the one that tends to be a little more mature and realizing, like, I got to get a job if I'm going to get an apartment, if I'm not going to go to college. So she gets a job at a coffee shop. And it's not Starbucks, but it's the same color apron. Again, it's, too, it's you know, it's the turn of the century. <laughs> it's t- over 20 Starbucks- years ago. Yes, Starbucks was a. Uh, it was out there. It wasn't the multiverse that it is today. But um, but yeah. So she's got the dark green apron on, and and um, there were many more independent uh, coffee shops even then than there are now. But anyway, so she's got the. Yeah, I was a barista in in right out of you know right out of high school. That was my job. I got a job as a barista. Did you like it? I you know I it, oh gosh I, I never gotta did tell barista. you watching, That's watching Scarlett Johansson like it so took me back the couple the, the place is still there it's called Twigs if you're familiar with San Diego it's on the university it's in University Heights the original owners they were theater folk like she was a set designer I think and he was a composer or something like that and this was sort of like their fun business on the side and so um, basically like they hired a bunch of surly adolescents like that like we were. We were allowed to eat and drink as much as we wanted. <laughs> basically, like a dream. It was not bad, and we, it had like cozy armchairs and sofas and newspapers and books. You know, this how as coffee houses did back then. And so we would just sit around eating cheesecake and drinking espresso after espresso and reading the newspaper. And then a customer would come in, and we'd be like, "Bye." <laughs> And get up and go and help them and be all surly. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so she gets a job at the coffee house and then Enid, because she likes movies, she's like, I'll just work at the movie house. She fails spectacularly at that. I'm going to let you handle the 430 crowd by yourself. And that way you can evaluate your performance while it's slow. And then we'll ease you into the bigger crowds, all right? You can count on me, sir. Cool. Do you serve beer? Any alcohol? I wish. Actually, you wish. After about five minutes of this movie, you're gonna wish you had ten beers. What are you doing? You don't ever criticize the feature. Why? What's the difference? I mean, we already got his money. (laughs) Look, that's the policy, okay? If you want to make up your own rules, open up your own theater. Yeah, let me have lots of butter on it. (sighs) There you go, smothered in delicious yellow chemical sludge. is wrong with you what i was just joking around with the customers it's my shtick we'll lose it and why aren't you pushing the larger sizes didn't you get training about upsizing yeah but i feel really weird it's pretty sleazy (laughs) it's not optional Because they they want her to upsell and they want her to be cheerful and not just tell your dumb jokes. She's like, that's my shtick. <laughs> it's like, you're, so you're not clever. <laughs> my, my friend from high school, one of my two best friends from high school, right when we were graduating from high school, she worked in the in the local art house, in the movie house. 
And she was always doing stuff like that. Like it's a miracle they didn't fire her, but it was, if it had been like an AMC, she would have been so out of there, but it was, it was like a landmark uh, vintage kind of a movie house. Oh, she did all the things like she would, she would just speak like that to the customers. She did the, the number one forbidden thing in a movie house, which is she would burn the popcorn and you would walk like the most unappetizing smell on earth is burnt popcorn. Oh, like people would worst. walk in. Yeah, if you smell burnt popcorn. You don't want candy. You don't want, you just want to get out of there. Right. So she, she would do, she would burn the popcorn. And um, yeah, so she, that's so, I mean, so that too, I was like, this is my life. <laughs> I'm watching my life. <laughs> they also set this in LA. So we do have a sense of place. It's not that, you know, bizarre. Seymour and Enid develop a friendship of sorts so she first she takes him on as a project like i'm gonna help you get a girlfriend she wants to make up to him for being mean and so she yeah sets about trying to do that and he goes on like some awkward dates which are like he goes to the blues concert and it's that blues band that's like oh oh my god like they're terrible so, so 90s brought up so much because <laughs> it was either that or swing bands like we're like all of a sudden yes there were some artists who were doing like a blues revival or doing like a swing revival but there were many 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 more artists who were doing really terrible blues and swing yes and it, it's something it was had, mostly that it was mostly that was dating in the 90s I, I swear to god so they she tries to set him up and he does actually find a woman finds him because they had connected previously through the ad, and then she was in a relationship. She gets out of the relationship. She contacts him, and then they go out on a really nice date, and he's like, oh, good, I'm with an adult. I'm with somebody who's a lot like me. And Enid feels jealous because she's developed feelings for him, and she likes having him as her lap dog. Let's be clear. She likes having somebody who just shows up when she tells them to. So she kind of sabotages that relationship. And at the t- same time, she loses her job. So she's sabotaging her apartment that she's supposed to get with her friend. And her first, her friend is offering to cover the rent, but then she realizes quickly, like, that's a mistake because she's, Enid needs to get it together. Enid's got problems. Then we get to one of the most, I think, difficult parts of the story, like nowadays, which is that there's an encounter between Enid and Seymour. Uh, She gets really lonely. She comes to his apartment. She's very vulnerable. And when I was listening to Krause and Zweigoff, Zweigoff, excuse me, talking on the soundtrack or the, the commentary track, and they're like, well, she was 18. So, I mean, I was like... Yeah, but he's like 45. This is not. Yeah. <laughs> this is, mm, that's not what the relationship was. Yeah. Yeah. So she, they def, they have sex and it's very quick. Like they do the kissing and then they fade out. Oh, yeah. It's not in the film. It's not very like explicit or anything no. like that. They, I will say that. Like at least they didn't. It wasn't like. What, what, what happens is that he. <laughs> so, so he. So he, as we said, he has this corporate job. Right, um, right. Okay, so we forgot he, all about the painting. Yeah. So he, I love this. this is, none of this is not in the book at all. And um, nor is the, I don't think the art teacher is in the book at all Mm-mm. either because they're still in school. So so in the movie, they've graduated. And I love the whole thing about having the grad. I thought that was such a good choice. Like when we got to that, I was like, oh, I see. I, like, I kind of like this idea of them graduating right, right off the bat. Enid has failed art. Cl- Enid, who is an artist, has failed art class. And she needs to... Um, she needs to take art over again in the summer. So she is taking this art class with all the other kinds of people who fail art. <laughs> <laughs> and the art teacher who is every art teacher is Ileana Douglas, who's amazing. And kids are really like, they're just bringing in any old thing and being like, yeah, this is a found object. It's, you know, and, and the teacher's like, oh, wow, that's so deep. And, and so as a laugh, Enid borrows this very racist piece of artwork from Seymour. It's a, a piece of his company's original logo, which is super, 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 super racist. We're not going to repeat um, it. And she, she brings it in and as an example of found art and as a statement on racism and, and uh, it makes a plausible argument. I think. Sure. <laughs> But she didn't do yeah. anything to it. I mean, she just, no, she I mean, just she brought it in. One little dash on there, I could have said, okay, I could see this here. But no, she didn't. Do my project based on this discovery as kind of a, uh, a comment on 
racism and how it's whitewashed over in our culture. Did you actually do this painting? Well, no, it, it's more of a, a found art object. And how do you think this addresses the subject of racism? It's complicated. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to show how racism used to be more out in the open and now it's hidden or, or something. And how do you think an image like this helps us to see that? Um, I'm not sure. I guess because when we see something like this, you know, it, it seems really shocking and we have to wonder why it's so shocking. I don't really know what to say, you know. I think it's a remarkable achievement. And then so she's, but she's like, oh, well, and at first you think she's going to set her up like, well, how do you think this represents racism? And Thorbert's like, well, I just think it's complicated, you know? And she goes, I think that's great. Like, that's so brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> and then not only, and this is on the teacher, man, the teacher yep. takes it upon herself to enter this very controversial found object. I mean, and then she never claims to have done it herself, right? Um, enters this very controversial found object into the student art show with zero context. What is, what does she think is going to happen? And, and we were led to believe that, that the teacher is assuming that Enid, who was, let's be clear, is still an adolescent, is still a child, is going to explain to the public about this it, which I, to me, like as an art student, as a former art student, like that crosses the line. Enid is not there um, when people first encounter the artist. So they're getting it like totally out of context. Like, what, uh, what is this? Why am I being assaulted by this very racist image? And Enid is not there because she's trying, she's at Seymour trying to ask Seymour to come with her to the art. She wants okay. him to see the art show, right? He asks her to leave because his girlfriend, Dana, who's not the greatest for him, um, but, you know, he's trying. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so they have a little bit of a fight because Dana, understandably, doesn't want her middle-aged boyfriend to have a friendship with an adolescent girl. Call her crazy. Right. Uh, anyway, I don't, I'm not comfortable so, with this. Let's just say. No, I'm not. No, no nor I. Seymour's like, yeah, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. So sorry, kiddo, I'm not going with you. And so they have a fight. And um, and she ends up not going to the art show, and but she does make up her mind that she will accept the art scholarship that her teacher has extended to her. So when she shows up to tell her teacher, yes, I think I do want to go to art school. Thank you very much for the scholarship uh, submission. She learns that there was a whole to do about her artwork and that it was ripped down from the walls and the newspaper printed out about it. Now, Seymour had made her promise that she would take very good care and not let this get back to you know, get back to him that he had had this work of art um we i'm not sure if his employer knew that he had it or not it but in any case it looks real he bad had, he had a scrapbook <laughs> and so that because uh, it had a racist name to it and so he mm -hmm. was collecting just as a historical document but he had all like yes. the, the menus and the napkins and things like the that. hidden history Correct. of the, his employer yeah so that would have presented a better a bigger picture a broader picture but i don't think they knew he had that painting or that picture You're right so he so to have it put out there and nobody's explaining like no 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 we changed this in the 50s this is something blah 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 so he's loses his job he gets fired yeah. she yeah. rebecca gets tired of of enid's just flibberty gibberiness and she cuts off the friendship because she's they're at different places she's excited rebecca's excited because she gets an apartment and has a little thing that you bring down and makes an ironing board and she's like isn't this great which i would have been like too oh that's cool you know an iron but she wants to pick out glasses and she's at pottery barn and she's having fun yeah. and enid's just nowhere near any of that she's just no she's not ready for any of that yet. no so she she no. winds up crying in her bed. We've all been there. And then she goes to Seymour's house and she says, oh, I, everything's screwing up. I'm messing everything up. Could you please just hang out with me for a minute? That's when they have sex. Yeah. And then the next day, they uh, as they move forward, she realizes like this is too much. Like she doesn't really want to have a relationship with him so much. Like he's... Yeah. She realized, like, oh, yeah. this is probably a line I shouldn't have crossed. I mean, she, it's like not like she hadn't had sex before, but still, it's different with him. So she's supposed to move in into her apartment, and then he's looking for her. 
Yes, so, because everything is blown up in the papers and right. he's lost his job. And yeah. he's upset. And so he, yeah, he, naturally. So he shows up at the apartment, and that's when Scarlett Johansson says, You know, you were, this was a joke we played on you. And that's probably, yeah, we're so sorry about that. Sorry, I feel that bad about me. that joke. And he didn't know. No. And so he <laughs> looks at the scrapbook, and in the, her art book, excuse me, where she does her sketches, she had it like, Oh, look at loser Seymour. And that's all he saw. And then he got upset. And mm -hmm. He didn't, when you go further, you realize he's develops a crush on him. So then he gets, she gets nicer and nicer pictures of him, but he just sees mm -hmm. that. So then he gets upset and he thinks Josh is in on it for some reason. So he goes yeah. to the convenience store and then starts losing it on Josh. Who's like, doesn't know what he's talking about. And then he doesn't know anything, anything. about it. He's, he's like, what? Yeah. And then he like tries to knock over something in the store, but it's bolted to the ground. And then the guy with the nunchucks comes in. Hey, did you have a good laugh at my expense? What do you mean? Do, 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 do you think that, that that's funny? Here, is that funny? I'll show you something funny. Hey, Damn it. come on. Get Not so cool now, are you? Huh? Good looking boy. Hey, hey, huh? hey, what's going on? Hey, call the cop, man. Citizen's arrest. You? Call the cop. Get the hell out of my store. All right, hey, hey. No need to get violent. I'm out of here. They're fighting. They're fighting. And he ends up in the hospital. So he's lost his job, he's yep. lost his girlfriend. Um, he's had this, he has slept with his, his, this teenager uh, girl. He probably should, teenager. He probably should not have done. And, uh, he's found out that he was the butt of the, a very cruel joke. And, um, now he's gotten in a physical fight with nunchuck guy and he's in the hospital. He's hurt. And, and she shows up and says, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I, I don't know what, what happened. And she's trying to make it up to him. And then she leaves. And we didn't mention that there's this guy that she sees that's on a bus stop. Something we forgot to mention of, when we talked about the book. Throughout the series, because when it was published as a series, but then throughout the graphic novel, as you read the graphic novel, um, Enid, as she's walking around her town, sees here and there like graffiti that says Ghost World. And she doesn't know what it means. In the movie, that does not happen. Yeah, they originally did, but they yeah. they took it out because they said it's yeah. just too obvious. Like I agree. I thought it right. was a good move. Yeah. And so instead we have this guy, this this older gentleman who was sitting at a bus stop and the girls early in the film are walking down the street and this is in like San Pedro, where I just was there. It it looks exactly the same. The girls are walking down the street and they see this older gentleman like, oh, he's sitting at a bus stop where the bus doesn't run here anymore. Like, we really should we should tell him. And um, and they tell him and they realize like, oh, he's not he's not living in this reality. Like, he really thinks that there's a bus coming and he's going to like move on to the next phase of his life. And we see throughout the film every now and again, like they walk by and he's still sitting there. And every now and again, like they she'll talk to him. Enid does. Um, Ina does. And he's like, yeah, yo, no, my bus is coming and I'm going to be, she's like, no, the bus isn't coming. He's like, well, that's what you know, because I'm, I'm waiting for this bus. Yeah. So that's, so that's the ghost of ghost world is, is, is this, this character, which I think is such an awesome move. I love that choice. I do too. She gets an argument with Rebecca. She had, you know, she goes to see him in the hospital. Rebecca basically says, call me later. I'm going to get another, I'm going to live by myself. You know, you figure, you figure yourself out and we'll have a chat, but she's basically peace out. I gotta, I gotta protect myself a yeah. little bit here. I gotta take care of my future. So she, mm -hmm. so Enid goes by the bus station and the man goes on the bus and then this, the bench says not in service. And you're yes, wondering, so, so what's going on? Yeah. So she, She's she's gotten to this point where every single thing in her life that she thought she could count on has blown up in her face. Her lifelong friendship with Rebecca, 
her friendship with Seymour. Her dad is now going to marry Terry Gar, who she cannot stand. Um, and she's sort of moved out of her house, but also sort of not moved out of her house. She's, everything is, is nothing is settled. And she has mentioned briefly earlier in the film that the guy, Norman, I think is his name. The, the man on the bus stop is the only constant in her life. <laughs> And so she goes over just to see him, just to like see that he's still there. And th there he is. He's sitting there. But then he stands up all of a sudden. And this old bus from the 1960s, it's an old bus, chrome, it, you know, it, it's probably they got it out of a museum somewhere. This old bus pulls up. Norman gets on the bus and the bus rides away. And she's just she's stunned. And the and the bench says not in service or no longer in service or something like that. And and she's just so now he's gone too. Everything is gone. And then it blacks. Then then we go to fade to black. And you're like, was well, that the end of the movie? I, and I thought, well, okay, that's a that's an interesting end to the movie, huh? Okay, so we just don't know. And then nope, fade back up, fade back up, and we are back on the street in San Pedro. And Rebecca is there and she's wearing a very nice suit, the kind that she probably should have worn to go apartment hunting. You mean Enid? And Enid, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Enid. And she's wearing regular shoes, not combat boots. And she has a little like 1960s hat box suitcase. And she's walking down the street at either dawn or dusk. Where is she walking? She's walking with tremendous purpose. And then we see her walking up to the bus stop which is now empty. She sits on the bench that says not in service and she's just waiting. And then we cut to Seymour with his therapist, therapist? who hates him. He's hates so we him. don't know what happened oh. with Seymour, but he's now in therapy and he lives with his mother. We're, we're told. Yeah. And he's like, he's trying to try to figure it out. He's kind of like, yeah. do I start getting a job? Do I do this? And the therapist doesn't care. Like the therapist is so mean. His mother shows up and says, did you talk to her about what we're going to have for dinner tonight? And he goes, no, yeah. I guess we'll talk about it in the car. And we forgot <laughs> to mention, I forgot to mention that when she first, when she goes back and talks to him, when she's crying, she says, why don't we run away together? Let's run away. Mm -hmm. And he realized mm -hmm. like, yeah, we're not going to do that. That's yeah. I'm not running away. Yeah. But to her, that's like, let's just start all over again. And I love the, uh, all the, you don't see this anymore. Thank God. But they used to see wires everywhere for phone wire. Phone. Remember the sky was full of wires everywhere, mm -hmm. everywhere. So that's what you see too. But she's on this like empty bus. That's on this empty bridge that apparently they blew up. It doesn't exist anymore. It's like by sixth street in LA. It's like the sixth street. Bridge. Oh, I thought it was still there. Is, I, it, is that there's, there's still bridges like that in San Pedro, but it's not the same one. Yeah. Um, I was literally just there and it looks exactly like that with yeah. the old, like, um, uh, uh, what do we call that? Uh, uh, what revival, what revival Margo, like, you know, like a Baroque revival from the twenties and thirties mm -hmm. kind of street lamps, you know, very Hollywood Gothic, kind of looking still there. I don't know if that bridge is specifically is still there, but it still looks, that area still looks very much like the very spooky, like haunted. Very vibe, much so. And sure. it's, and you get yeah. that a lot from people, especially in LA coming and leaving LA. People want to be movie stars or whatever. So that's kind of, but she's going on this bus and she, you don't know where she's going because it's at a yeah, weird time of be, day. There's nobody else on the bus. And it's the, it's a bus from this. It's the same bus that picked up Norman. It's the, it's the vintage sixties Chrome bus. Is it real? Is she dreaming this? We don't know. Is she going off to art school? Cause we didn't, we didn't hear, although things kind of went kablooey, we didn't hear that that offer got rescinded in any way. So she could very well be going off to art school, which would be great. We don't know, but, she, but what we do know is that she has so, through all this sequence, which has no dialogue. Um, we get that she has come to terms with the fact that she needs to let go. These things, you know, the, put, the time to put away childish things, like, is that from the Bible? I don't know. But um, Or Joni Mitchell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but she realizes, like, I need to move on, you know. Just like I was really impressed when um, when they're in the pottery barn and, like, how, how 90s a pottery barn was that. 
Um, did you not right, finish remember? your apartment? I couldn't afford potty, no. Pottery Barn. I would oh, go no, there would for go the inspiration dream. and then Absolutely. I'd go to the dollar store, try to find something that resembled. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I appreciated that when Scarlett Johansson was like, well, I'll pay for everything and you can pay. And she was like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. So she, yeah, she realizes like, you know, I need to stop caring whether my dad marries, you know, if that's what he thinks is right for him, like, that's not my business. I gotta, I gotta move it. You know, I need to move on from this thing with Seymour. That's, it's kind of weird. And, uh, you know, it's it, at, at the very least, the timing is off and I need to, you know, and I need to let Rebecca ha- live her own life and do her own thing, you know, and she's not been be a good friend. Having, she's been a good friend and not have me dragging her mm-hmm. down, you know, and, um, and so it's just this symbolic of her just moving on into her future, uh, uncertain though it may be. And I just love this movie. I do too. And when I, as usual, when we go down our rabbit holes, I went down the hellish Reddit, Reddit rabbit hole, where there's a subreddit about whether or not she dies by suicide. There is a whole... Oh. There's a whole... Fo- and by the way, Zwigoff and Krause say No. Absolutely no. not. It's just symbolic. Why would you think that? There's people because of the bus. The bus is empty. It's the bus could a, be a lot of things. That's what I say too. This is like mm. yeah. That that's I the creators. There's a whole subset of people that think that they say no. They say absolutely. They were gobsmacked see. when they heard because yeah. they said absolutely that is not the case. No. Funnily enough, Thor Birch at one of those Comic Cons said, I don't know, it seemed really dark to me. Like, I think she was mm-hmm. in a really dark place. But that's a different thing than that. She is in a dark place, but she's also very young and she's got options ahead of her. But yeah, she's got she's got to figure things out. She's got to grow up quickly and figure things out. And that's that's mm-hmm. her lesson. And yeah, I I felt the same way. At first I was like, oh, they just got to be bratty and obnoxious. They think they're too cool for everything. And then you realize, like, it's all a front. Yeah. They're very vulnerable underneath. You know, we all just want to be smart and funny and cool. <laughs> it's just, it comes with some effort sometimes. You want to make it, you know, and it's it's relatable to me. Very relatable. So much, yes. There, I just loved it. I just thought it was done so well. I really loved the choices that were made that were different from the book, I thought, I thought were really smart. And, uh, and was, starting with, like I said, having them graduate at the beginning of the story, I thought was uh, a very interesting, especially because I had just read the book. So I had just read the book and in the book, they're leading up to graduation. And I don't know about you, but like I finished the book and I was like, Oh, but what happens to them? I want to know what happens next. Cause, cause they're not in a good place. They're not, they're not ready to move on to the next thing when the book ends. Like they're still very much in that, like, what's going to happen. Um, And so to have the movie kind of pick up, the movie kind of picks up where the book left off, even though we're replaying some of the stuff that's in the book. So I really liked that the movie does look at that slightly next step in their journey. I, I just, I loved the choices. I loved having it be the graduation right at the front. I loved the, the Seymour thing, you know, I wish they hadn't slept together, but okay. It just was very authentic. And I, I just really appreciated the whole thing. I thought it was so well done. I did too. I love the costuming. I see oh. when this movie comes out, like the following October and every October since then, I've seen somebody dressed like those two. <laughs> like, like doing a version of Ghost World cosplay, it it's it just really holds up. It's super smart and it's super. I don't know. It it gave me the feels. It actually really gave mm-hmm. me the feels. Me too. Yeah. Me too. And I thought it wouldn't. I really thought like when I was watching the beginning. Uh, I know. Even the trailer, I was like, mm, I don't know. But uh, no, it got me. It got me. So anyway, so it does have a. It does have something of a ghost. Yeah. A little bit ghosty. Hey, you know, yeah, we got a little ghost in there. So and a mystery. We did. So oh, book versus movie. Ooh. I really loved them both. I'm gonna give the edge to the movie. And I will say it had a much more memorable soundtrack than the Lorax. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we covered last week. If y'all don't know, yeah, oh, yeah. This soundtrack is fun, and it's good soundtrack, good soundtrack, um, and not yeah, overdone because they could have no, jammed it. Thank you. with pop hits and just they could have, and, and they yeah, it's just enough. Like we get Seymour's records, 
and we get the punk and we get the, it, but yeah, you're right. Just, it's not hitting you over the head with the soundtrack. And I love, you know, the, 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 um, what do you call the Indian the music? score? Yeah. No, the score, the actual score of like them just walking down the street when, they, when we do have music and there's a lot of silence, you know, where we're just hearing the ambient noise, which I love anyway. Yeah. yeah I'm going to say movie. Um, but I loved them both. I really, it's so, it was like such a nice surprise yeah. to have such a fun experience reading the book and then watching the movie. Especially it was really cool. because uh, a lot of the books that we covered for um, Band Book Month, we some of them were bummers. So I was worried this would be a yeah. bummer or I would just be annoyed Same. by it, which was going to yeah. also be like, oh, that's going to get on my nerves. And I actually wound up loving it and, and Same. really going, yeah. And I have to say, I think uh, Steve Buscemi is a big part of it too. He's, oh, definitely. He's, Seymour, he's so really, he's great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and then Thor and, and Scarlet should do all the movies together. I just want them to <laughs> make them a crime duo or something. Like, I just, I would watch it. Give them a series. Yes. <laughs> Netflix series. So let's talk about what we're doing next. I just love October so much. Should we, we give them so many October? Good should we options just give them on the a- table. Should we just give them all? Okay. Uh, We'll do this in a particular order we're figuring out. The next episode will be Wait Until Dark. It is, Mm -hmm. we've had a lot of requests for it, by the way, because we do cover plays to movies. Audrey Hepburn, Alan Arkin. As soon as Alan Arkin died, I was like, Margo, we got to put this on for October. I know. I love that man. It's one of my favorite roles. So that's what we're going to do next. Then we have, for the month, we're going to figure out which day we're going to do things and what time of the month. But House of Usher, Fall of House of Usher, the one with Vincent Mm -hmm. Price, right? That's the one. Yeah. We're also going to do, I love this, I Know What You Did Last Summer. Fabulous. And then back to Stephen King. Everyone's been begging us for Stephen King. We're going to cover Misery. Yes. So that's our October. Spoiler, Misery will probably be last because it's the longest. Yeah, so we're going to we're going to probably need the whole month to get ourselves through misery because we we have a very we just outside of the podcast we have a very busy October. It's been like years of people asking us to do misery, <laughs> so it's time. It's we got to do it. We got to do it. I know I'm very excited. I'm so excited to read um Wait Until Dark. I, oh, he's so good in this movie. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I'm very excited. It's fabulous. It's like New York City late 60s. Audrey Hepburn at apartment. I, I always in my mind, I imagine, I always see this movie as the the flip side of Barefoot in the Park. Oh yes, oh it's the evil Barefoot. In the yeah, Park. yes, it's the evil universe. It's like two blocks away too, like compared yeah, like where yeah. they filmed it. It's fabulous, and it's 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 got a great jump scare, like of all jump scares. I saw it when I was at a peak. It was at the Poconos and I was on a, it was a junior high trip and they, that was the movie they played for. And there's a big picture of all of us going ah! from that scene. All those places I mentioned at the top of the show, please send us your suggestions. Also our email once again is book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review if you can. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at Brooklyn Margo for Twitter. Also, Blue Sky. I got an invite for that, Margo. It's Tell me about it. I, I only recently heard about it. Of course, I have not even really jumped on the threads train myself. I'm but, on threads too, uh, trying to figure out something so that I don't have to use yeah. X anymore because but it's we're there there for we're there for now. And yeah, we and we all of our social media we're just about books and movies. So just just to warn you, not warn you, just anyway. I'm at Brooklyn Fitchick for threads and Instagram. Uh, my site is brooklynfitchick.com and I am on the TikTok at Margot Donahue. That's my name. All right, everybody. Happy October. We're super psyched about this. Next week it will be wait until dark. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We are a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You can find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. We follow the hashtags Lady Pod Squad and Potter Family. If you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, go to P-A-T-R-E-O-N and look for Book vs. Movie Podcast. We have a basic Facebook page, but we also have a private Facebook group. Go to Facebook and type in Book vs. Movie Podcast Group if you want to join that. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Book vs. Movie. Spell all those words out. 
If you'd like to send us an email, it's book versus movie podcast spelled it all out at gmail.com. You could follow Margot D at Brooklyn Fit Chick on social media and Marco P at She's Nacho Mama. Thanks so much again. For-